at the chapter 1 of Isaiah. And this is the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Okay. Now, brother, if that doesn't sound like it would put you to sleep quick, you know, well, here, this is real Bible study. I ain't into this stuff. Okay. First of all, let me show you how this is exciting this is. First of all, it is a vision of Isaiah of what? Judah. You know what this vision is? It's the vision of the right hemisphere of your brain. It's a vision of the right hemisphere of your brain. This is the vision of God given through this guru prophet from the middle of the desert about you and the holy secret place within you, the vision of Judah and that which is Jerusalem, which as Paul has told us, Jerusalem, which is above, is free, and is the mother of us all. So as you embark on studying the book of Isaiah, no longer will you be looking at it as a description of old places and old people, you'll be able to get past the words and it will explode to you that this here is a vision of the kingdom within you. Okay? Now, interesting, let's look at the kings of Judah. Here is Judah. If we're going to take the premise that Judah indeed is at the right side, okay? This is the right side. Judah. The king's names, and, and this is why I say never run past the Bible and just go over anything and say, well, here was Amos and Uzziah and Jotham and so forth. Let's take a look at who are the kings of the right side. First of all, Uzziah. The, words, you, the, the word or Uzziah means strength. Strength. Strength rules from the right hemisphere of the brain. The other one you have here is Jotham, okay? Jotham means perfection. Perfection rules from the right side. And didn't the Apostle Paul said, now leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Another one here is Ahaz, okay? Ahaz means possessor. It is no longer I who live, it is Christ who lives within me. I am possessed by he who is the Lord of lords and the kings of kings. I am possessed by Christ. From the right side, the rulers of the right side are strength, perfection, and the possessor, that which is the Christ mind. But there's another one here. Jotham, Uzziah, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And Hezekiah, again, means strength. Strength, perfection, and possession. And that rules. Those are the kings of Judah. See? They are not the kings of the left side. They're not the kings from the lower aspects of the mind. Fear, anguish, guilt, doubt, and all of the depressions that go with it. This is the strength of God. This is the perfection of God. This is the possession of God possessing you. And you you'll see where I'm talking and where I'm coming from. And we might say, well, well, he's talking about Judah. The book is just talking about Judah, which is over there in the Holy If that's what you want it to be, if you want this to be a ge geography book, let it be. If you want it to be a history book, have at it. If you want it to be a Bible, start understanding it spiritually. Start understanding it mystically. That's why it says B-I-B-L-E on the front of it, not history book, or you can go to get novels anywhere. This is a book of spirit. You're going to have to understand it spiritually. So here then, this is the vision of Judah. And Judah represents those inner qualities. Judah is the origin of the word Jew. In fact, if you were looking at some of those terrible pictures from the Nazis' uh, explosion against the Jews in, in Germany, every place you would see where they would go uh, writing on the walls, they wouldn't write J-E-W, they would write that. And then they would put, you know, the, the star, and that would mark someone who was a Jew. And it comes right from that place, which is Judah. And, 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 and this is what the, the Apostle Paul said. The Apostle Paul said, a Jew is not one outwardly. A Jew is one inwardly. This is a spiritual thing we're talking about. God's chosen people is not a particular race or a denomination or a culture. Because it says in the Bible, God is no uh, uh, respecter of persons. And he, he's not going to turn around and say, well, these are my favorites because they're born here. That, what does that do for you? All of a 
of a sudden, as soon as you're born, you're a second-class citizen with God. Well, we know that's ridiculous. And, 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 and as, as Moses Maimonides said, whenever you see something in the Bible which comes against your common sense, God's trying to tell you something. Who are God's chosen people? Those that dwell on the right side, the Jews. Those from the tribe of Judah. And when you come in here and hit the floor and hit that pineal gland and let that melatonin flow, just like we were talking this morning, you're camping at the right side, you're one of God's chosen people. You are a Jew, inwardly, because you have circumcised the flesh. Now, go to page 115, if you would. Page 115 in your little Bible. And for the rest of you, the book of Numbers, chapter 2. And let's take a look at, at this particular thing. And remember now that Isaiah is seeing this vision of Judah. Chapter 2 of the book of Numbers, page 115 in your little Bible. And we'll look at chapter 2, verse 3. Here we have, the, here we have, if you watch with me here, I want to show you something that some of you have seen before, but it's very interesting. This is the way the tribes of Israel were lined up Four tribes on each side, but they put the tabernacle in the center of the desert, the camp. Okay? On the north was the tribe of Dan, which is the emotional nature. In the west was the tribe of Ephraim, which is the intellectual nature. In the south was the tribe of Reuben, which is the physical nature. And in the east was the tribe of Judah, which is the sp spiritual nature. Okay? And it says right in your Bible, at the point of the rising sun, at the place of light. Okay. Now, if you look, and this is, this is where Judah is formed right from the beginning, right there. And if you look, you're always looking north. And when you look north, Judah, or the east, is always at the right side. And that's why Jesus says, cast your net to the right side. And that's why Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. And that's when everything either happens at the right side or the east. In the Bible, the east and the right side both mean the same thing. When they came, the magi, the astrologers, to find Jesus Christ, where did they come from? The east. That means wisdom comes from the right side and will bring to you the location of Christ with him. When the star of Bethlehem shone, where did it shine from? The east. Because it's light that comes from the right side. Okay. All of that is written for a particular purpose. And you'll even see in the Old Testament, I believe it's in Jeremiah, which says God dwells in the place of the east because he's in the right side. Otherwise, you, you, you just have to sit here and believe that this whole thing is something that happened and never happens anymore. If you get into this and begin to understand this, you'll realize it happens to you every single day of your life. The sun shines from the east. The wisdom comes from the east. The Christ is born in the east. He splits the eastern sky because the sky is the higher part of you. And from the right side, here he comes. I don't know why people are afraid of that. Afraid of finding that the Christ is alive. He has returned. He dwells inside of you. And he waits for you to turn your face to the east and recognize him. He said, and, and Albert, what is so difficult for us to think this is true when Jesus said this morning in John 14, 20, at that time you will know I am in the Father, you in me, and I in you, right where he said he would be. Okay? Now, take a look if you would. If we're looking over here at the right side to the tribe of Judah from the east, take a look with me to page 204 in the New Testament in your Bibles. And for the rest of you, go to the book of Hebrews. Book of Hebrews, page 204 in the New Testament. And we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. And we've gone through this. I think we've been going through this on our Sunday mornings before Albert got me off the track with this dynamite thing that he brought here. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. What happens to the evangelists? What happens to the popes? What happens to the priests? What happens to the ministers? Huh? The Lord, the high priest, sprang out of Judah. The rest of these guys come out of Levi. And what here is being said by Paul, and, and this, is, this, is, this is very, very interesting, see? 
of which mo the priesthood was the tree, tree, uh, tribe of Levi, the Christ is not found there. You, what this is particularly telling you and why it's so important for you to understand this is the Christ is here. You're not going to find him in church. You're not going to find him in religion. You're not going to find him in a Bible. You're not going to find him in Bible studies or hymns. You're not going to find him in all of your prayers. You're only going to find him in one place. That is the tribe of Judah. That's where he springs from. He's at the right side. He's at the eastern side. He dwells within you there at the right hand of power, which is the right hemisphere of your brain. And here the apostle Paul specifically says, our Lord sprang out of Judah, which is the place of the east, the place of the right side, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. Because the priesthood was made of man, this high priest who dwells within you is made of God. Is made of God. Now let's go back to page 579, where Isaiah is going to take us deeply into... Uh, a confrontation with ourselves and if, for those of you who would want to uh, sometimes you get a chance you can read the book of Isaiah and the book of Isaiah is another book of Revelation it will explode to you in symbolism that all come down to mean you that's talking about you yourself your inner self your your, your holy place okay here uh, Isaiah chapter 1 verse 2 hear O heavens and give ear O earth okay Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. Here is the message. The message of God is the impulse to your divine consciousness, which is heaven. When that message comes through the divine consciousness to the right side, it comes through to your lower intellect, which is earth. Open yourself in meditation to that which is the heavenly movement, and it will then come down to you and open itself in wisdom to your intellect, for those day-to-day -day things that you have to do to your consciousness, to your lower mind. Now look what it says here. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Now that, that's, when you look at something like that, the initial thing you're going to think of is, oh, we've done bad things, and we have to do better. What would you do better? And everybody would do exactly what you're going to do. You'd stare, because you don't know what you did that was so offensive to them in the first place. What the heck did you do? Did you spit? Did you chew gum? Did you shoot pool? What did you do? Did you say bad words? What is offensive to him? Some places they say, well, you can't drink and you can't smoke. You go to other places and the priest drinks and smokes. What's a, what, who's right? You didn't read your Bible? Which Bible? There's 30,000 versions. Which one will turn them on? Because there are people that tell you, you got the wrong Bible. You didn't go to church? Which church? Well, I go into church, and we don't like that talking in tongues. Well, I go into church, we talk in tongues. When we delay in him, we don't do any of that. Which one are you going to go to? All different things. So how did you rebel against him? What did you do? Don't you like God? Did you ever call him a stinker? What did you do that he got so ticked off about? You didn't do anything. You can't do anything. Go to page uh, 148 in the New Testament. Keep your finger there in the Isaiah. But go to 148 in the New Testament, the book of Romans, okay? Right after the book of Acts is the book of Romans. And what does it say in Romans? It says in Romans chapter 8, okay, verse 16. First of all this, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. I always get a kick out of that dot when somebody says, don't you believe that Jesus was the Son of God? Certainly. So am I. I'm his brother. You're his sister. What's the big deal about that? Jesus never made a big deal about that. We're all sons of God. We're all children of God. But here the Bible in Isaiah 7, I have raised up children of God, and, and they've rebelled against me. See, remember, this concerns Judah. This concerns the right side. This concerns the place where our spirit bears witness with God's spirit, but instead of touching the spirit which dwells on the right side, we have rebelled against it, and we've touched that which is the left side. And who rebels against it? Who tells you don't do this? There are people that have the pants scared off of them for fear of coming down this stairway on a Tuesday night and entering into meditation. Oh, I don't get near, I don't get near that stuff. Scared to death, except this is the direction of the Lord Jesus Christ, who says, why do you call me Lord and not do it? Because I don't do it because I'm going to church. And they don't allow me to do it. 
do it. They said they shouldn't do stuff like that. So, where do you stand? Where do you take a stand? And run away from the mob and stand with Jesus Christ. And I, I, I'll, know, I'll tell you one thing. Any people, anybody that came here this morning has to think doubly, really twice about this. Because indeed, as science is now finding out that when you obey the Lord Jesus Christ and you follow what he says, it unleashes the power of healing which floods your body. Then why don't you do it? Well, there's evil in you. There is no evil in you because the Lord Jesus Christ says you are the light of the world. Well, I'll open my mind to demons. Jesus Christ said if you ask your father for a fish, he's not going to send you a serpent. Who are you going to believe? The point is, people that say Jesus is Lord, it's not true. The church is Lord. The pastor is Lord. Religion is Lord. They don't even know what Jesus Christ said. I get this garbage from Christians all the time. You'll open yourself to demons. I said, look right in the eyes. And Jesus Christ says, if you ask your father for a fish, he's not going to send you a serpent. I trust him. Who do you trust? Trust him. You can. Somebody said today, we were over at the Chinese restaurant, and they said, so beautifully. You can put a little baby and sit a little baby on top of a refrigerator. The baby may be only this big. And you could stand at the bottom of that refrigerator and say, jump, I'll catch you. And the baby will jump. Trust you. And Jesus Christ says, come in to the deep darkness. Jump in and I'll catch you. And the Christians say, forget it, Charlie. No way. I ain't going to jump. That's too Eastern. Too Eastern. I've got to celebrate Easter. <laughs> Where'd they get? Why don't they call it Wester if they're so against Easter? And then it would go along with wabbits. You miserable wabbit. Why not? What does it say in Revelation 2 4? It says, You have left your first love. Your first love is the divine principle within you, which is God. Listen to me. When you lift yourself above the thoughts of your mind, you are no longer you. You and God are now one because where there's no thoughts from you, all there is is God. If there is not a thought in your mind, you have separated from the carnal aspect of yourself and now you have returned to the Father's house. You are the prodigal son returning from all of the slop in the pig pen of the lower mind. You have come up to the mountaintop to the Father's house. It is no longer you. There is no thoughts from you and you and him have become one. Where there is not a human thought, there is not a human being. There is God. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Now let's take a look at something. This is interesting. Go to the book of Psalms. And let's say where this vineyard of life is, where God feeds you and where the trees grow and where the grapes grow and where the fruit goes. 505 in the Old Testament in your little Bible. The rest of you to the book of Psalms and chapter 80. Book of Psalms chapter 80. All right. And let's go to verse 14. Here's the prayer. Return, we beseech thee, O God. Look down from heaven and behold and visit this what? Vine. Okay? Vine. The vine is that which grows and produces the grapes, which is, produces the wine, which is spirit. Okay? Now let's take a look at the very next verse and see if we can locate something here. And the vineyard which your right hand has planted. The vineyard. Which your, why didn't he plant it with his left hand? Why didn't he use both hands? He planted it with his right hand, okay? And the branch which you made strong for yourself. Who's the branch? Come on, you've been coming here long enough. Who's the branch? You are. A lot of people say, oh, that means Jesus. Jesus Christ said, look out. I'm the vine. You're the branch. You're the branch. The branch which he made strong, attaching to that vine in the vineyard on the right side. So the wine can flow, the spirit can flow. The vineyard, which is God's beautiful playground from his children, has been made desolate. See? Weeds are growing there. Most people's vineyard is overrun with weeds and rocks and dirt because they haven't been taken care of it. They haven't been up there watching the vineyard because they have been warned, stay away from the vineyard. It's on the right side. And who did such a terrible thing? Who made this vineyard such a terrible place? Take a look at page 633 in your Old Testaments, if you would. The rest of you go to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah. 
uh, who said something about before, Jeremiah was a bullfrog, whatever he was. I don't care if bullfrogs wrote this, it's right. Jeremiah, I want to see who wrecked this vineyard, don't you? Yes, say yes. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see who wrecked this beautiful vineyard on the right side. Jeremiah chapter 12, you there? Verse 10. Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 10. What's it say? Many pastors have destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. You don't go there anymore, do you? Because they've told you, stay away. Let the weeds grow. Let it turn into a garbage dump. Pastor. Better look at this stuff. As much of the stuff you've seen, you've never seen before. But you better get on this side, the God side. Don't worry about being on the men's side. And what does it say, Jeremiah? They have made it desolate, and being desolate, it mourns unto me. Look, what, why is it made desolate? The whole land is made desolate because no man lays it to heart. Huh? Jesus said it's a very narrow pathway that leads to that vineyard, and very few people find it. There was a lot of people this morning found it. So there's the rebellion that Isaiah's talking about. My children have rebelled against me. He gave you a beautiful vineyard. He gave 10% of your brain, your mind is the left side, which is the carnal side to take care of all the business. And you know what? That's where religion has its cathedrals. That's where religion has its chapels. That's where religion holds its prayer meetings. That's where religion holds its church services, from the left side. They've never crossed over to the right side. They've never crossed Chile, Jordan. They've never gone across the Red Sea of Emotions and let that sea open up to go to the Promised Land. They've never, ever, ever turned to the east and walked through those beautiful valleys into the vineyard. And they've warned other people, don't go there. Don't go there. Don't go there. Where's the vineyard? Where's the Garden of Eden? Where did I say? Over here in Judah? In the east? Where's the Garden of Eden? Oh, you must know of the Garden of Eden, right? Started the whole mess, right? Nobody ate an apple, that's what I always thought. <laughs> Where is that? Come on, easy to find. Go to the book of Genesis. Let's take a look and see where it is. I don't have a problem with this, my friends. I don't have a problem taking this Bible and documenting everything I say with it. Never. I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem documenting the words of Jesus Christ. I don't have a bro And I also don't have a problem obeying the words of Jesus Christ. And I don't have a problem doing what Jesus Christ said because people warn me not to. I don't care about people. I care about Jesus Christ. And I will do what he says, period. And that's what I want you to do. If he doesn't say it in here, don't do it. But if he says it, brother, do it. And walk away from the mob. And if they want to go over the cliff with a herd of pigs, let them go. You turn around and say, I'm staying with him. <laughs> I'm with him. <laughs> I'm with him. Wow. Genesis 2. Let's see what this vineyard is, okay? Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. My friends, there was a time when all mankind dwelled in the right side. The 90% of your brain. And we revolted because of the nature of the beast, that being the attraction of desire. And we left and were cast out to the left side. And there's where we've been ever since making our own little tin gods and our own little tin religions, building our little towers of Babel to reach God and saying, you're using the wrong kind of bricks. You're using Methodist bricks and they won't work. You have to use Catholic bricks and the Pentecostal bricks and the Baptist bricks and the Buddha bricks and the Christian bricks and everybody's got their own bricks and they're all building their own places and it's all falling apart. And they'll shoot you. If you don't use their kind of bricks, they'll shoot you. Up in Ireland, they don't have the Catholic bricks and the Protestant bricks. And if the Catholics try to use the Protestant bricks, they'll shoot you with a machine gun. And in Israel, you have the Jewish bricks and the Arab bricks, and they'll shoot you. 
And here the only reason they don't shoot you is they'll go to jail. But if they could, there'd be a guy right there, bang, bang, because these are the wrong kind of bricks. You know what bricks are? You know what, made, you know what bricks are made with? Slime and mud. And every time in the Bible when man is constructing out of his own religion, it's made with bricks, slime and mud. Whenever it's made of God, it's stone. It's natural. Never build a temple with bricks. It's always stone. Okay, let's go real quick. Where were we? Isaiah. What page? 579. Here we are. The book of Isaiah. And we've gone about 40 minutes. And we've gone two sentences. And now we're not doing this every week, so this should take you until you retire. And where will I be when you retire? Because some of you are younger than me, believe it or not. <laughs> oh, brother. But I tell you, I got a lot of energy. So until that runs out, I'm going to keep going doing this stuff. We had some energy this morning, and we do. And it doesn't make any difference. You know that. It doesn't make any difference if there's eight of seven or 78. We do the same thing, right? We together. Because it's not us, it's that spirit within us that shouts these things out. Get so excited. So, Isaiah 1 3. Look at this one. The ox knows his owner, the ass his master's crib, but Israel, Edith, uh, excuse me, Edith, Ethel, Israel, it's <laughs> an old joke, but Israel does not know why. My people do not know. Consider. That's all I have ever asked anybody. I've never asked anybody to believe anything. I said, for God's sakes, think. Think. And they say, oh, we're not allowed to think about that. We can't talk about that. We can't look at this. My people will not consider. What's it mean? What does it mean? It, it, it's a little different the way you're looking at it. You're looking at it more literally saying, well, an ox knows his owner. You know, he'll go to his owner and so forth and so on. The ox knows his owner. The lower flesh is totally aligned with the lower mind. That's what it means. It has nothing to do with an ox. Any more than shooting the bull has to do with the bull. Okay? Any more than he's a, a lamb or a sheep and wolves clothing has anything to do with sheep and wolves. The ox knows his owner means that your lower flesh, which is the physical, the ego, is totally tuned into that which is the ruling aspects of the carnal mind. Your flesh, your, your ego, your mentality responds to your lower mind. You know and you are ruled and controlled, right, led by the nose, by the thoughts that come into your mind. You'll do what those thoughts say every single time. The ass knows his master's crib. Our stubborn nature is totally aligned with the fleshly ego. And you know how? You're looking at one, pal. You want to see me get stubborn? I'll. Sometimes when I am on a trip like that, I don't even talk. I go, Mrah. How do the asses go? Mrah. That's it. Mrah. That's what I am. Know all about. Because why? It doesn't make any difference what you say. It doesn't make any difference how much truth you get me. Say, I'm doing it my way. That's what it's talking about. And when I am tied into the things of the flesh and we get the temptations, I am battling now. I'm on a new kick. I'm eating Japanese food with the nurse and Chinese food. We're getting in to cleanse our systems out. I'm getting away from ice cream and drinking all of this stuff. That's a battle. That is, the ox is, is straining to get at the straw. Barry. See? Clarify, drinking what Dr <laughs> drinking, oh, drinking soda. Okay. I'm going to tea. To tea. Nice tea. I'll drink. Okay? But there it is. See? But look what this is. See? The ego is tuned in to the ass. The flesh is tuned in to the ox. But... The spirit and the mind together producing the God within. This is the part. And what does God say? My people, Israel, they don't consider this. They won't even think. They read Bibles. But you know what they do when they read Bibles? They read another Bible. They know what they do after they read a chapter? They read the next chapter. They even have Bibles so you can read the whole thing in a year. And then next year you can read it again. And you can read it and read it and read it. Just don't do what it says. 
Don't do what it says because there's a lot of stuff in there. Let them interpret it for you, what it means. Like, read it and read it and read it. My people don't consider. They won't even think of it. Meditation. Go and tell them to come and meditate. They won't, won't even consider it. Jesus taught it. They won't do it. Tell them about chanting Om. <laughs> what? We've got a bowl that says Om. I told you down there. They're all nuts. Don't go near that place. <laughs> what did Jesus say? Page 71 of the New Testament. Jesus Christ is my Lord. I don't know about anybody else. I do what he says. Page 71 of the New Testament. And Luke 11. Come on with me and see what Jesus Christ said. Go to verse 52. Luke chapter 11, verse 52. Some of you must know this by heart, and you should know it by heart. Woe unto you lawyers. You know who lawyers are? Ministers and religious people who interpret the Bible. Woe unto you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in you hindered. What's he have to do? Draw pictures? He can do that too. How clear does he have to be? You have taken away the key of knowledge. And you've got to understand it. And you've got to, we all have to know. We, we knew something was going on. But how many of us would ever have sat still to understand this Dr. Wilson's connection of the pineal gland, secretin melatonin, and healing cancer if we didn't know and didn't enter within and begin to understand these things through the power of God? But you've taken... No, no, no. You can go into any church in this town, in any town, I'll bet you, you can go in any church practically in the whole state of New Jersey, and you tell them what you heard this morning, they're not even going to have the slightest idea what you're talking about, because they don't have the knowledge, because they don't enter within themselves, and other people that are entering in, they're telling them they're going to open their minds to demons, they're hindering them, and Jesus Christ said, woe to you, in other words, are you going to get it? And the reason you're going to get it is you're not tuning in in a harmony with the universal presence of God. That's why you're going to get They don't know, they won't consider. Well, let's do one more, and then we'll, we'll get out of here, because I'm, I'm running you late, and it's been a long day, but I just, I'm not even getting anywhere near what I wanted to do tonight, but I can't, I don't have the time. Isaiah 1, chapter 4, page 579, Ah, sinful nation. Nations in the Bibles are symbols of higher and lower nature. In Japan, okay, the nation that represents God in Japan is a part of a country called Kami, K-A-M-I. It's the high country. It's the mountain country. And that's the symbol of God in Japan, Kami. And, and, and for many of you who hear about the Second World War, they used to have guys that would give their life for the emperor and for God, and they'd crash into American planes. They were called kamikaze pilots. Okay? That's where that came from. Kami. The low country, Shimo. Shimo is the low country, and Shimo is the country of representing carnal consciousness, the passions of the lower emotions. So sinful nation is consciousness. Sin is not separation. It, it, it is separation from God. It is something you are, not something you do. Romans 8, 7 says the carnal mind is not able or subject to the law of God, neither can it be. Nothing you can do about it. You can try to be good, and you're still going to be what you are. And you don't even know what's being good. Did you ever think about it? What is being good? What do you have to do? You have to put yourself in a, in a, in a, in a closet and lock the door. What else can you do? Because if you're walking down the street, and there may be a little filly walking down there with her short skirt on, and if the nurse isn't with me, I just might go like that. You don't see them what's going on. No, I know. It's because you stepped on my glasses. I'll shut up. I haven't shown you. Well, you do. That's just something, you know, not, especially when we get out of Key West, you know, and I'm walking, you know, I don't know where I am half the time anyhow, but I'm walking around, and she says, did you see that one? Okay, but what I am saying is, to many people that sin, I see people on television, on religious television, that if they say the word sex, you know, how could you have, what would you do without sex? That's right, Albert, <laughs> what would you do? You're, 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 even if you're an animal, what would you do without sex? What's wrong with that? Why do we make guilt out of that? 
you know? Because of the fact that we are not in harmony with God. And that's the whole thing. Don't you remember Adam and Eve initially? No problem. No pro they didn't have to have uh, shorts on or uh, uh, maiden forms and all of this stuff. <laughs> oh, but there's, no, there's nothing wrong with anything. Everything is nice, right, Albert? I mean, it's good enough for a kangaroo. It's good enough for you, right? But all of a sudden, religion comes, and it's a sin. By they have a two-piece bathing suit on, and all of this stuff. It's, it's junk. They make sins. You know where the sins come from? Not from the situation. It comes from how it's perceived by the filthy mind. And generally, the mind that creates all of these bugaboos out of religion is filthy. They put people on guilt trips. See? So it says here, sinful nation, and this is, a, this is an interesting thing, and we'll wrap it up with this one. A people laden with iniquity. Take a look at that word laden. You know what that word maiden means? Burdened down. Burdened down. Loaded up with all kinds of iniquities which are wickedness. Load it up with it. Carry it on your shirt. Lines up with Romans 8, 7. It's the mind. People are just overwhelmed with this thing. The mind is a burden to us. If indeed the Apostle Paul is telling the truth and the carnal mind is not able to obey the law of God, then where's the burden coming from? If indeed the Apostle Paul is right in Romans 8, 7 and your mind cannot obey the law of God, Who's guilty for all of this stuff? How is God blaming you? Did you ask for the mind that you've got? So then where's your responsibility? And the Apostle Paul is very clear in Romans 8, 7, the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither can it be. Then how can you blame people? You can't. You can't. You can blame that which is the lower aspect of the flesh which dwells within each person. That person inside is yearning to be free of it, would love to be able to rise up into high realms, but is totally under the control of the thoughts that come out of the lower mind. And I'll tell you something, and as you're seeing recently on television here, it doesn't make any difference how much money you have. It doesn't make any difference whether you live in an estate in Palm Beach, Florida, or if you live in the Fork and River, or wherever you live. When that thing gets at you, you'll do things. You'll do things, and sometimes the passions well up so that you'll just reach out and you'll do things. You're a good person. You've never broken the law in your life. You've never hurt anybody. But all of a sudden, the passions flare up, the burner from the lower is going, and you reach out and you do something, and when that act has been done, and the next day the cops come or it's in the paper, all you would want to do is blow your head to pieces and die. Because that's not the type, but that thing inside of you rears its head and screams, and you do what it says. That's a burden. And the way that God, the Lord Jesus Christ, has allowed you to understand is that you have an absolute escape from that lower thing by following, obeying Jesus Christ. Do you know what that is? Here it is. Take a look at it for just if I could, if I could show it to you. Here's the iniquity. Here's the iniquity and the garbage of all of the lower mind. And Jesus Christ said, raise yourself up. If your eye be single, raise yourself up to the upper room. And when you break out of that lower stuff, you are into salvation. Once you have lifted yourself above the screams and the pitches of that lower mind, up into the higher realms of God, you are saved. You are saved out of all of that junk and all of that fear and all of that hate. You're saved. You've got to understand something. A lot of you people just talk about people being saved. If, if, you can't, if, if you can't be saved out of the horrors of your own mind, if you can't be saved out of the cataclysmic events that happen in your own family, how in the world do you think that you're going to be saved out of this, which is the universal presence of God? God can save, Jesus Christ saves, but Jesus Christ cannot save anybody if that person will not do what he says. And Jesus Christ says, don't call me Lord and not do what I tell you to do, because I'm not. I can only be your Lord if you're willing to trust me and I need every bit of you. I need your mind. I need your spirit. I need you. But if you're going to have an allegiance to that bunch out there, if you're going to have an allegiance because the evangelist said this, then you're not listening to me. And if you want salvation, you've got to come out from the crowd. You've got to separate yourself from the crowd. You've got to separate yourself from religion. And you've got to walk 
that lonely walk with Jesus Christ that takes you out of the mires of the screams of your lower mind into the bliss of nirvana, into the higher realms of consciousness. It's the only salvation that exists. And that's the salvation out of hell. That's why the Red Sea is red, because it's churning emotions. That's why you see a devil painted in a red suit, because the color red in mysticism always means the emotions of the mind. And the devil has two horns. It means the power that comes from your own emotions is hell. Nothing more. Nothing, there's, nothing, there's no other place that exists. You're not finding it in the universe. It's all right in here. God's kingdom, as Jesus said, is in here. That means heaven is in here and hell is in here. And if you'll follow him and lift yourself out, or you can sentence yourself to eternal damnation by dwelling life after life after life in the carnal mind in all of its fears. It doesn't have to be that way, and it shouldn't be that way. Because now, especially now, you know where the place is. You just have to bring yourself to the point in saying, I have enough faith in Jesus Christ to trust him and to go his way and walk his walk. Talking about it is cheap. Saying Jesus is Lord is cheap. Making him Lord and obeying him takes a little guts. Because they won't like you. But they didn't like him either. You don't forget, it wasn't a bunch of rabble-rousing mafia members that killed Jesus Christ. It was religious people that called for his head. Okay. Christian Village Church.